Hi, everyone. Welcome to another webinar in our crop insurance series. Uh, today, we'll just be doing a refresher of all the different policies and programs we've covered uh, over the past few months uh, while recapping some of the webinars and videos that we've uh, shared. So these are some of the, or these are all of the past video and webinar topics we've had uh, in the past few months. Uh, I'm going to be going over some of the more specific uh, focused webinars and videos, like about the specific um, different programs and policies we've talked about. But I wanted to highlight a couple webinars that might be worth checking out again for a rewatch, especially um, the webinar about what a grower needs before going to an insurance agent that can kind of help you prepare before you go to meet uh, with an agent, kind of get a feel for what they might ask or what you might need to bring. Also our Q&A with an insurance agent and an RMA representative, that was a really great webinar where they just answered questions uh, some viewers had sent in, uh, as well as other questions we'd been asked at conferences. And they gave us a good overview of a lot of uh, type of questions um, that they get asked as well. Uh, it's kind of real broad on several different crop insurance topics, but it's definitely packed with information, especially to have an RMA representative there to speak with us. Uh, and also the um, the step by step uh, with one farm through the price estimator tool. I'm going to touch on that in the, a bit, but that one is worth a rewatch just to see how to use that program to sort of estimate what your costs might be uh, with your uh, insurance, depending on which crops you're growing and which program you decide to choose. So first, I'm going to go through some of the crop insurance programs and policies we've covered. We've covered these many times and at different uh, conferences and webinars and videos, but just a quick refresher. Uh, first up is multi parole crop insurance or MPCI. So this is the one that is the single commodity. Uh, so one policy covers one crop. So if you've got multiple crops, you would need separate policies. That's why this is geared towards more uh, large acreage in one crop, you know, one or two large commodities. Uh, because these, uh, this policy is um, just one crop, uh, the coverage varies by crop and by county. You have to have a lot of uh, growers or a large amount of acres in that one specific crop to have a policy in that county because each policy, uh, policy that's written has to be done specifically by crop and by county. The USDA Risk Management Agency is the one that uh, writes these policies. Uh, so if you'd like to have your crop covered, you would go to them uh, a couple of times and you'd suggest uh, getting this policy for your crop in your county. Uh, and the key with the MPCI, it ensures based on your yield. So it's going to look at your past, uh, you know, five to 10 years of yields in order to determine what your, uh, how many, uh, you know, bushels or whatever units you use to measure, how many of those you should insure um, in case of disaster. And the MPCI policies are going to protect against loss due to natural perils like uh, disastrous weather events, you know, hurricanes, tornadoes, floods, uh, blizzards, uh, hail, um, you know, drought, uh, as well as fire. And then it's also going to uh, protect against some living threats. So this is going to be insects and disease. Uh, you have to use proper IPM or proper control measures uh, and prove that you used uh, those measures and it still wasn't enough. Um, the MPCI policies cover insects and disease uh, if there's a, a large amount of it, and it, it destroys a lot of your crop. Some of the other policies we'll talk about 
only cover insects and disease if a weather event or a natural disaster causes the insects or disease to be bad. Uh, like if there was a flood on your trees or in the area that has your trees and maybe some like a root pathogen or uh, something caused your trees to die because of that flood, those would be covered. But the MPCI is going to cover it um, if it's just for some reason just a large amount and you tried to control it and it didn't work. Uh, this is also going to cover the failure of water supply uh, for irrigation, which is uh, important in certain areas of the country, as well as prevented planting. And that could be caused by, you know, a weather event, um, natural disaster for whatever reason. Next is our whole farm revenue protection. So this is the one we've talked about the most in regards to horticulture growers seeking out crop insurance. Uh, this is best for very diversified farms. And a lot of our horticultural growers are diversified farms. Uh, this whole farm revenue protection covers everything on your farm under one policy. So, you know, anything from animals uh, to your vegetables, fruit, uh, even your uh, value-added products, all under one uh, policy. So you're not having to get those individual policies. Uh, and unlike in PCI, this is available in every county. Uh, I've mentioned before, if a crop insurance agent tells you that there is no policy available for your farm uh, or what you're growing, uh, they're not being truthful because uh, this whole farm revenue protection would cover anything you're doing on the farm, uh, as long as you're producing it. Um, you know, if you're like uh, bringing in cattle to butcher and then you're selling the meat, you're not producing the, the meat. So it's not going to cover things like that. Uh, so it's anything you're doing on your farm producing wise. Uh, and the other thing that separates whole farm from the MPCI is that it is uh, protecting a loss against a loss in revenue. So it's not looking at, you know, how much your, how, how many bushels you got of your corn or how many pounds of uh, strawberries you got. It's looking at uh, your revenue for your whole farm combined. So what type of farm operations are covered? It's all your commodities that are produced, all vegetables, fruit, plants, flowers, uh, livestock, etc. Then you've got your value added products. So anything you're canning, freezing, even pickling uh, on your farm is included. Uh, also processing activities. So uh, maybe you've got a good vegetable washer and you wash for other people and they pay you uh, to wash, that would be covered. Uh, also drying or packaging. Uh, and then commodities uh, that you buy for resale. This one's pretty important. Um, a lot of times growers will have to maybe replace their tomatoes or uh, buy in some, you know, a couple bushels of corn or something. As long as it's not over 50% of your total revenue, uh, the whole farm is going to cover that. And new this year, we've talked about it several times. This is still uh, technically the whole farm revenue protection, but this is the new micro farm policy. So this is for farmers that are uh, that have a revenue under one hundred thousand dollars. So this is a lot of the growers we work with, a lot of horticulture growers, uh, and very uh, diversified farms are typically under one hundred thousand um, dollars in Kentucky. They're selling mainly direct to market, and this this uh, policy was created for those growers, people that are selling at farmers markets, selling at on-farm stands, uh, selling, uh, you know, just locally to people, maybe online or uh, subscription services. Uh, so these people uh, maybe don't have, uh, you know, the volume or the uh, amount of uh, crops to keep up with records for. So the point of this micro farm is uh, less reporting, so you're not reporting 
expenses. You're not reporting individual commodity prices or yields. So with the regular whole farm, you would have to list all your commodities and then give the revenue uh, per commodity and also the price of each commodity. <clears throat> with micro farm, instead of doing that, you just give your farm revenue, that's it. There's no prices required, no yields. You don't even have to list what commodities you're growing. You're just listing uh, your whole revenue. Uh, this program was designed to be like a stepping stone into the whole farm revenue, uh, the regular, uh, because they're hoping, you know, a couple years of this uh, less reporting, maybe easier option for people that are new to crop insurance. Uh, by the time you get above $100,000 in revenue, uh, you're ready to step up with that, the, the more intensive reporting uh, that's required. They are allowing you, if you've previously had micro farms, so obviously not this year, but next year, if you had the micro farm policy this year, next year, if your revenue was above $100,000, you'll be able to uh, be allowed to have this policy for one more year. Uh, the next program I wanna talk about is also uh, from the USDA RMA, and this is the Rainfall Index. Uh, basically, this, this program is uh, ensuring against the lack of rain, uh, but only affecting uh, annual forage, so like hay, pasture, rangeland, and forage, and also apiculture, so honey. Uh, so you're not looking at uh, yields or revenue coming from those three things you're looking at lack of rain, that's it. Um, you know, you don't have to have natural disaster, any of that, it's only lack of rain. So how this is determined, uh, you would uh, put, give them your uh, the address or the address of your farm or, you know, the coordinates of your acres, uh, and they will tell you your grid. So the grid is about 17 miles by 17 miles. It's on the map and they know the rainfall data uh, based on that area. So they can tell you the average rainfall uh, for any month uh, in that area. So then the grower would select uh, an interval and the intervals are two month periods. So, uh, you know, maybe you want April and May and you want July and August. So you would select those. And then they would, uh, they would tell you what the average rainfall is for those intervals you selected. And then you would pick your coverage level. So the coverage level is uh, kind of the percent of, rain, the, of the average rainfall that if it drops below that, you'll get a payment. It, but if it stays above that, you won't. Uh, so for uh, an example, say you picked April and May, and your average rainfall for those that interval was uh, 10 inches, which is a lot, but it's uh, for an easy example. If you selected like 80% coverage level, you would get uh, a payment <clears throat> if the rainfall dropped below eight inches. So if it was seven inches, seven and a half inches, you would receive a payment. But if it was eight and a half inches, you would not receive a payment. So it's a pretty simple program to, to understand, you know, I pick my level of average rainfall. If it drops below that, I'll get a payment. The next program is a farm service agency program. Uh, this is the NAP or Non-Insured Crop Disaster Assistance Program. And we've talked about this program many, many times uh, over the past few months. Uh, and just like the multi peril crop insurance, this is for individual crops. So you would need a different policy or a different uh, application for each crop. And this is um, only available for crops that don't have available crop insurance. So if you were not able to get a multi peril crop insurance policy because there is no policy in your county, then you could apply for the NAP. And this is only gonna protect against uh, disasters or the damaging weather events, natural events. 
And then those problems like insects or disease that could come from weather or natural events. <clears throat> so uh, it's in the name disaster only. It's not gonna look, uh, protect against um, you know, anything that's not a disaster. The eligible crops list is uh, pretty extensive. So it's, you know, any crops grown for food, livestock consumption, fiber, uh, crops in controlled environments, so greenhouse grown, uh, high tunnel grown, uh, ornamental plants, even cut flowers. Um, and then they've got some down at the bottom that, you know, might not fit into any of those categories, but Christmas trees and sod are included as well. Next is another uh, FSA program. It's the Tree Assistance Program, or TAP. And this is the one we've talked about before, um, that this is the one program you don't have to apply for ahead of time. So this is kind of an in case of emergency. So you only apply if you've got uh, a lot of damage or loss from a natural disaster. Um, so the FSA will have a list of um, you know, disasters that were declared either by the president or um, the um, Secretary of Agriculture. They have to declare uh, you know, a natural disaster uh, because of a storm or um, you know, whatever natural reason. Um, and once that's declared, if you're in the area that is uh, covered by that, you can apply for this if you've lost your nursery trees or your orchard trees. And then you would could receive financial assistance to either replant or rehabilitate uh, those trees, bushes, or vines. Um, and you do have 90 days to apply after that disaster um, in order to receive payment. Uh, the TAP covers ornamental fruit, nut, and Christmas trees, but it doesn't include uh, the timber trees. Uh, and you have to be selling either the plants themselves or the produce from the plants. So, you know, you can be selling the apples or you could be growing apple trees to sell. Um, it's, it, it covers both. And uh, it's important to note they can be grown on owned or rented land. So if you're a nursery and you've got a bunch of fruit trees in pots on land that you rent, those would still be covered. So now I want to shift away from the policies and programs uh, into the record keeping. Uh, record keeping we've talked about with uh, each of the programs in the past, talking more specifically about what records um, each program or policy might need, because they do tend to differ um, on what records they require for application. I want to make a note that uh, we did put together a record keeping workbook that can kind of help you get started. It's not going to, uh, you know, have spots for everything you might need. Um, it may not uh, be perfect for every program or policy, uh, but we did our best to kind of consolidate the needs um, onto uh, into a workbook, and that's available on the Kentucky Horticulture Council website. So uh, most of these policies will require at least five years of records. So that's important to keep in mind. Um, so <clears throat> if you're newer to farming or growing, you may need to wait a few years before you can apply to uh, these crop insurance policies because they are looking at your past yields or your past revenue in order to determine you know, how much you should be insured for. There are some options for beginning growers and uh, maybe growers that are switching crops, uh, but you would need to talk with uh, your crop insurance agent uh, to determine what uh, your options are. I know if, uh, you know, maybe you purchase a farm and you're going to continue growing what they've been growing, uh, there are ways to kind of substitute some records. Um, but you would need to speak with a, an agent to make sure uh, that's doable. Uh, and the key with record keeping, um, you know, 
just keep anything you can you think might be important so maybe you're not maybe you're a few years off from starting the crop insurance uh, um, process but if you start keeping the records now you'll even if you've got excess records later on uh, you won't have to try to think or come up with the answer uh, at a later date and when you begin the application process try to have all those records together in a neat place where you're not going to have to go searching for those records. And I threw together this uh, a list of some of the crop and production details that might be needed for uh, these applications. First off is a farm number, a farm serial number. If you're doing any of the FSA programs, you're going to need that farm serial number. You'll also need to fill out the, the forms and records that they require to, to be filled out every year or keep on hand uh, at the FSA office. You'll need to keep track of crop names and varieties or types, not only for your use as a, a grower, a producer, uh, to know what you planted, uh, you know, look back at past years to see what you had planted in the past, um, but for uh, uh, application process, uh, you may have to uh, be required to provide, you know, varieties and types in order to determine prices. Um, also in determining prices, you need to know the intended use of the crop. So fresh, uh, processed, direct marketed, uh, those are all going to determine the price that is put on your application for your, your product. And then the uh, organic or conventional practices will determine the, the prices as well. You want to be insured at the price, uh, you know, that you actually sell your crops for. So you want to make sure uh, you're keeping track of these and you can prove uh, your past prices. Uh, next is irrigated or non-irrigated. So this is very important determining, you know, how much you're going to be insured for because uh, sometimes non-irrigated crops might not be insured as much um, as irrigated. Uh, with non-irrigated, I assume they, they think you're taking more of a risk by not irrigating your crops, um, but it's important to keep track of maybe what fields are irrigated and which aren't. You'll need to report uh, planting dates and locations. Those things will get reported afterwards uh, once you fill out your application. Uh, but having those past planting dates uh, is important uh, as well. And then finally, the tax and IRS information, specifically the Schedule F. So with the whole farm revenue uh, protection policies, the Schedule F determines basically your policy. So it, that is what has your revenue, it's what has your expenses, um, so if you're a, a farmer, you're filling out the Schedule F already, uh, but that is what's going to be useful when applying for a whole farm or the micro farm policies. And also keep in mind when you file. So uh, your application dates for these policies and programs may be dependent on when you file your taxes. Uh, like end of or calendar year filers are going to, their application dates are going to be different than people who file taxes um, at the end of fiscal year um, or early fiscal year filer. So it's important to keep that in mind as well. Uh, I want to touch on this USDA price estimator tool uh, walkthrough webinar we did. Uh, this was uh, a webinar about a couple USDA tools uh, that we can look at to kind of help us determine what policies we might uh, consider uh, going about purchasing. So first was the, uh, the USDA RMA Commodity Program Finder Map. Uh, this QR code will take you to this, this map uh, website. I'll also post it in the um, description of this video, and it is posted in the description of the uh, estimator tool walkthrough webinar. And so this map allows you to uh, choose your commodity, 
and it will show you which counties actually have policies available for that commodity. So, uh, for example, this was, uh, I put in peaches, that's probably the only uh, single commodity that's horticultural uh, in Kentucky that has uh, coverage. And that's only covered in two counties. So you can see on the left-hand side, I put in, um, you know, peaches. I selected that as my commodity. And then it highlights the counties that have a peach policy. So in Kentucky, it's Logan and Warren County. And then it gives you the plans that are available. And it shows there's only one plan available, and that's the APH or actual production history. So that's a type of multi peril crop insurance. So that if I'm growing peaches in Logan County, that tells me the policy I should be looking at. Also in that webinar, we went through the USDA RMA price estimator tool. So this tool, you get to select what type of policy you're looking at. So whether that be the uh, APH, uh, multi peril policy for peaches, or you're looking at uh, whole farm revenue or the micro farm policy. There's even that option in there now. And you will just fill in some basic information on your farm. Uh, it'll, you'll put in your prices if you know that. You can also just play around with it and try to guess at some of those things. Uh, and then it should tell you what your price would be if you decided to ensure your listed commodities with that policy. And it's pretty interesting to compare, uh, you know, what the total premium for that uh, policy will be. And then it'll show you how much uh, the USDA or the government is going to subsidize. So they're going to eat a lot of that premium price. So you, it'll be a lot uh, pretty discounted uh, premium that the producer then has to pay. So it's it's really easy to, to see uh, or convince yourself that it's worth it. With, if you're insuring $70,000 in revenue for only, you know, $1,200, depending on, uh, that was sort of about the example we went through. Um, but it, it helps put things in perspective. And then the last uh, or the, the last video we've posted uh, was a conversation on the other types of insurance that you might need in addition to crop insurance. Uh, so we've spent several months talking about crop insurance, and that's what this series is about, but we also wanted to, to touch on a few other types of insurance that growers also need to be thinking of, um, depending on what their operation looks like. Uh, and so we, uh, with crop insurance, uh, it's going to protect against the loss of yield or revenue. That's what we just talked about. We've been talking about it for several months. Uh, but this is only from the time of planting until it's harvested. Uh, and then, you know, obviously sold, but you're, you're protecting mainly about that growing time. Uh, because of, you know, natural disaster. Uh, then we, in this video, we looked at farm liability insurance, which is uh, going to cover you against any damage or injury that's caused on the farm, uh, whether that's farming activities or not. Uh, you know, like someone comes out to your farm for the, you know, a hayride or something and gets injured. Um, you know, someone's out there for a, your you pick operation and they fall and get injured or they, you know, uh, trip over something for whatever reason, uh, if you're, uh, it's gonna protect you uh, from any medical bills um, that arise from that. And there are some other ways we talk about to protect yourself uh, in addition to the liability insurance. Uh, and we've talked about that in that video. It's a great video to go back and watch. And lastly, we talked about product liability insurance. So this is uh, insurance for after it's harvested. So if you harvest your produce and then you sell it and later on people become sick, whether from contamination or some other foodborne illness, 
you could be liable for those medical bills, uh, you know, no matter how extensive they are. Uh, so product liability insurance is going to protect you against, uh, you know, having to pay all those medical bills yourself. Uh, it's important to note that this product liability insurance is, uh, you know, mainly about the medical bills, not so much the recalling of the products. There is product re uh, recall insurance. And we do talk about that in that video as well. That would be like paying to have, um, you know, product removed from store shelves, uh, you know, replaced on the shelf, um, you know, any of the shipping or uh, advertising to recall the products uh, would be included in that. And uh, it's important to note that the product liability insurance uh, might be required to sell in certain grocery stores, sell to some schools, uh, depending on what they require. So a lot of uh, institutes are requiring this product liability insurance uh, to protect themselves and the customers. So that's the last uh, webinar I wanted to kind of go over. Like I mentioned at the beginning, there's many, many uh, videos and webinars we've gone through. Uh, this was kind of just to refresh some of these ideas we haven't talked about uh, in a couple months. And you can find those on our YouTube channel. Uh, if you have trouble finding it, uh, we can send you a link as well if you email us. Uh, but I'd also like to acknowledge our, our funding, where our funding comes from, and it comes from the Southern Extension Risk Management Education Center and the USDA National Institute of Food and Agriculture. Uh, they provided the funding for these, uh, these webinars in this series. Um, we do have a couple more webinars and videos lined up. We'll have a video at the end of June. And then we'll have webinars in July, August, and September to close out the series. Uh, thanks for coming to the webinar and thanks for watching.